All right. Welcome back economic students to our second week of virtual class. Um, we talked about before scarcity, and that was the discussion question, forces us, everything's in limited supply facing a world of unlimited wants, forcing us into decision making. Uh, we have an either or decision or a marginal decision, one more. All right. We talked a little bit about um, <clears throat> quantity demanded and demand. Quantity supplied and supplied. <clears throat> Again, quantity demanded is one point. Demand, uh, all the points of, of quantity demanded at every price point. Quantity supplied is one specific quantity that suppliers want to supply at a particular price point. Supply is all the quantities supplied at every price point. Okay? Now, we can have... Um, a movement along or a shift, but let's uh, first talk about bringing the supply and demand curve together. Okay, when we do bring the supply and demand curve together, where they intersect is called equilibrium. Okay, equal, balance. What is equal and balanced? The quantity demanded and the quantity supplied are in balance. That's at equilibrium. Okay, now. At this point, where supply and demand uh, intersect, uh, being equilibrium, we uh, call it uh, a market clearing equilibrium uh, price and a market uh, clearing equilibrium quantity. <clears throat> in other words, we are in balance and there's no shortages or surpluses. For instance, quickly again, if this was our equilibrium here and we're talking about tires and the tire uh, equilibrium price was $80. <clears throat> that gave us an equilibrium quantity or a market clearing uh, uh, equilibrium quantity of 4 million tires. Now, if for some reason the price floated up to, let's say, uh, $100, we just bring it across. Well, what we have at $100. We have a, a movement along the demand curve from equilibrium sliding back and up to here and a movement along the supply curve sliding up and over to here. So in other words, we have a surplus. How much of a surplus? Well, it stands to reason the higher price, the demanders are happy, but the supplier, the, uh, demanders, I'm sorry, demanders are not happy, suppliers are happy. All right, so the demanders, let's say they cut back all the way to two million, but the suppliers, they're really happy. They're making six million tires, all right? Now, this is a surplus of four million tires, which the can, cannot be sustained. The market will cause pressure to build to move us back down from these points back down to equilibrium. In the same way, if the price floated down, let's say, to here, down to, let's say, $60, we've got, at $60, the price went down. Now, we have the suppliers aren't real happy because the price is so inexpensive, but we as demanders are really happy. So, just the reverse is going to happen. We're going to have a huge demand for the tires, but there's not that many going to be made. So we're going to have a huge, uh, not a surplus, but we're going to have a huge shortage. Again, market pressure will come to bear to slide us back along. Again, the existing supply and demand curve. We're not talking about any shifts now. We're just talking a movement along the supply and demand curve, bringing us back to equilibrium, all right? Now, once we are there, we say, okay, at equilibrium, we are in balance, and the quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied. Now, but in equilibrium, we, uh, at equilibrium, we know in economics, things can change. Be, uh, for instance, um, at a, a grocery store, you've got uh, at Myers, 30 lanes, checkout lanes, only three are open. You've got three long lines. 
Well, if they open up three more lines, you're going to have pandemonium for a while. People are moving back and forth, but eventually things will settle down and you'll have six lines about half as long as the first three. That will be the new equilibrium, okay? And, and that's, that's somewhat like the situation here. And the quantity of demand is equal to the quantity of supply. Now, we also know that we can have shifts. That is when the entire curve, supply or demand, is moving at every single price level. And rule of thumb, anything moving to the right, whether it's the demand or the supply curve, means more is being transacted for. Anything moving to the left, whether it's the supply or demand curve, means less is being transacted for. Okay, price is fairly easy to, uh, to uh, imagine. I mean, we're just going up and down. Quantity, a little different. We're moving to the right, it's an increase in the quantity, or we're moving to the left, a decrease in the quantity. Now, what happens when uh, either we talked about uh, major factors that can cause demand or supply to shift? Well, they would be something like uh, increase or decrease in the population uh, or increase or decrease in the number of suppliers in the market. A major event, um, technology typically increases at every price level, supply, okay? Um, any event that would cause an increase or decrease at every single price level is called a shift. Sometimes we, we talk about supply shocks. If you've had economics in high school, they refer to that quite a bit. Normally a supply shock is, is not a good thing. Uh, something has happened in the marketplace that's caused supply to be pushed back to the left, all right? That would be uh, a supply shock. But let's say, let's take a look at what happens if demand or supply shifts. Well, our rule of thumb is that when demand shifts either to the right, meaning more, or to the left, meaning less, demand will always give us one good outcome and one not so good outcome. For instance, here we have a demand shift to the right. What's happening? Well, we were at this point here, but now demand has shifted to this new demand curve here, so we are at a new equilibrium point. What does that do for us? Well, what it does for us, it just says, well, we're all the way up here, and we see that the price has gone up because we're here, but the good news is at least the quantity transacted for has increased. So the not great news is that price level has gone up, but the good news is, you know, our economy is busy. Things are, 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 a lot more things are being transacted for, and we shift to here, all right? Conversely, if something happens in the market that causes demand to decrease, we are going to go from here all the way over to here, meaning we are going to go from this equilibrium point, and we're going to end up at this equilibrium point down here. What does that do? Well, what it does is that we were here with a equal, uh, price uh, equilibrium here and a quantity equilibrium here, shifted to the left. Now we are at our new equilibrium point. And as you can see, the price has dropped and also the quantity transacted for has dropped. So the good news in this scenario would be that shifting to the left good news is the price has come down. The bad news is the quantity transacted for has also decreased quite a bit. So we are in a slowdown, we are in a, a recession, something of that nature. All right? So those, those are the uh, things that cover uh, shift of demand. Shifts of supply are a little different. You either get two good things or two bad things with a supply shift. Now, in this case, uh, which is called the best case, doesn't happen all that often, but the supply shifts dramatically to the right. 
Okay, what's going on? Well, we were at this equilibrium point here, and when the supply shifted all the way over to here, now we are at out to the right and lower at this equilibrium point. So what has happened? Well, the price has actually gone down because we were here and now we're here. The price has gone down, but the good news is that the quantity has increased. So we got the best of both worlds. We have prices going down and we have increased uh, quantities uh, transacted for. So this is uh, uh, the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is just the opposite. A huge tsunami hits Japan, wiping out all their hydroelectric uh, power plants. Or uh, they talk about a major hurricane hitting all the refineries uh, in, in the Gulf states. And again, oil is one of the key inputs to industry, so that cuts clear across industry, causing a, a major shift of supply to the left. Now, when supply shifts to the left, this is the nightmare scenario. This is when we go from this equilibrium point and we shift all the way over to this one. Now, what's happened? Well, first of all, we see that the quantity transacted for goes back all the way to here. Now, that means we are probably in a recession, all right? So not good, but on top of it, not only are we in a recession, but the price level has gone from here all the way up to here. So we have rising prices and we are in a recession, all right? Uh, this happened twice uh, in a major fashion uh, during the 70s, and that's where they, they coined the, the term stagflation. We had a stagnant economy with high inflation. And as a matter of fact, it was even, uh, you could say it was even worse than stagnant. So this is the nightmare scenario. This is the one, uh, interestingly enough, it, which is the toughest one for a government to address because the government has fiscal and monetary policy, which we'll be talking about in the weeks to come. To, they have fiscal and monetary policy to either stimulate uh, the economy or to contract, cool down an overheated economy. Well, when the government's looking at a situation like this, applying fiscal or monetary policy is, is difficult because the, we are in a recession. However, we have, we have dramatically rising prices. So government has to be very careful in, in terms of what they are going to or, or how they're going to stimulate the economy because they're, they're trying to bring us out of this recession, yet we are already incurring inflation and the last thing the government would want to do is, is kick us into hyperinflation, and which ap absolutely destroys an economy. So this is the basic uh, shifts. Um, can both shift at the same time? Yes, they can. And a lot of times it will depend, uh, the outcome will depend on which shifts more, the supply or demand. But for our intents and purposes right now, this is, this is what we need. Demand shifting uh, to the right or demand shifting to the left. You're getting one good thing, one not so good thing in either, either case. Or supply shifting to the right, two good things, more being transacted for at a lower price. Or supply shifting to the left, which is the worst case scenario. You've got a recession and you've got rising prices. Okay? All right, so that's the beginning of what can happen when uh, a supply or demand curve shift. So we have movements along or we have shifts, okay? All right, that'll take us out of our first whiteboard and into our next one.
which is here. And again, I apologize. I still haven't moved back. Uh, the future lectures will be uh, a lot easier to see. I will have a better um, setup at home where I usually give uh, these lectures. Let's see if I can get rid of that glare. Well, it's still a little... Okay, I apologize. There is a little glare here. Um, I will try to uh, try to cover that glare up as much as I can. Um, well, now we, we'll move into the idea of consumer surplus and producer surplus. Okay, well, what, what is this uh, consumer surplus and producer surplus? Basically, consumer surplus has to do with and I know it's, it's happened to all of you. It happens, happens to me. In your life, you've probably bought something. And when you were paying for it, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, I'm pretty happy about this because I would have been willing to spend more on this particular item. Could be anything. Could be tickets to a concert or whatever. The addition that you would have been willing to spend, that is, is what is known as that surplus. You uh, and it's a good thing, all right. You would you would have been willing to spend more, but you didn't have to. Why didn't you have to? Because the free market had established a price for you to pay, and conversely, producer surplus has to do with the fact that you're selling something, and when you sold it, you were probably maybe perhaps a little happy because. You would have been willing, if push came to shove, you would have been willing to sell it for even less. But you didn't have to. Why? Again, because the market had established a price and you received the benefit from it. What this uh, shows is that here there are some folks that um, would have been willing, and that's illustrated by the demand curve, going all the way up to where the demand curve is, they would have been willing to spend this much more money on the item. They got the biggest surplus, okay? But they didn't have to spend that because the market had established a price. And as, you know, there's maybe not that many. Uh, let's say it's a ticket uh, to a concert. There were a few that would have been willing to spend twice as much, okay? But they didn't have to. They got the biggest sur consumer surplus. Maybe uh, these folks here, they would have been willing to spend, uh, you know, an extra $20, $25, all right? Now, there's more of them, but they're not getting quite the sur uh, consumer surplus as the folks way back here. And as we get closer and closer to equilibrium, there's more and more folks enjoying the surplus but they're getting not quite as, as big bang for their buck. They're not getting quite the uh, addition to what they would have uh, been willing to spend as opposed to what they had to spend, all right? This, this amount, as you can see, is getting narrower and narrower, okay? Till we finally get to equilibrium. And it's the same thing with producer surplus. You get a, a few folks that are getting, uh, let's say you're just starting a business and you're, it's a tire business, and you're really looking for sales, all right? Market uh, price for tires, let's say, is $80, but you're just starting your business, and you're really hungry for sales, you would have been willing to spend, sell for $45. Now, there's not too many of, of you like that, but there are some. Those would be the folks in here. They're getting the, the biggest bang uh, for their buck because they would have been willing to sell the tires for $45, but they don't have to. They can sell them for 80 
Now, as we move along the uh, supply curve, and again, this is your absolute minimum. This is what you need. This is what you have to get. It is the combination of your costs and so on and so forth. As we move towards equilibrium, we have a few more. Let's see, these folks have been in business for, oh, a, a couple of years, all right? Now, would they have been willing to sell for less than uh, $80? Yeah, and there's a lot more of them, not going all the way down to 45 but let's say they would have been willing to sell for 60 okay? So we fill, we fill all that in. And as, as we move further and further towards equilibrium, you get a lot more folks, but what they would have been willing to sell for and what they actually did sell for, that, that differential is getting tighter and tighter. This whole area is called producer surplus. The top area is called consumer surplus. And when we add them both together, we get consumer surplus and producer surplus. And oddly enough, we call it total surplus or social welfare. And it, it, it's a good thing, okay? So, specifically, consumer surplus is the difference between our willingness to pay, as illustrated by the demand curve, for a good or a service, and the actual price we have to pay that has been established by the market. And, specifically, producer surplus is the difference between our willingness to sell, illustrated by the supply curve, you know, with our costs involved, all right, and what we actually did sell it for as established by the uh, free market, okay? Now, we allocate the resources uh, to maximize total surplus. We say we are uh, totally efficient. This represents, you know, the greatest amount of efficiency, all right? Now, what happens uh, when we talk about, again, efficiency and um, equity? Well, we can be 100% efficient, meaning we are utilizing everything to its max, but that doesn't mean we are being fair, equitable, all right? So, in being totally efficient, uh, and, and this is in, you know, allocation, uh, we can be totally efficient in production. We can be totally efficient in, in consumption, meaning we've pulled out all the utility from uh, every asset or every eventuality that we have. We've pulled out all the utility from it, uh, and we can be totally efficient, but we still, that does not mean it's the best outcome for everyone. We're not being fair, Okay. So we have, to, we have to balance efficiency with equity, okay? So we look at that and uh, we say, well, sometimes we have to, we, there's a trade-off between efficiency and equity. And, that, and that's true. That's life, all right? So we, uh, we sacrifice a little um, efficiency for equity, okay? Um, this is not... Uh, to say that uh, we don't uh, tr strive for equity, but there is, there is that trade-off. Now, governments come in and, and they try to uh, adjust the marketplace, which we're going to take a look at in a, in a, a minute or two. Uh, however, when the government comes in, typically there uh, ends with an area of uh, dead weight loss, meaning nobody gets anything, all right? Not no one gets anything, but in that area, no one benefits from it. It's called dead weight loss, okay? So we're going to take a look at that in, in a minute. Uh, the dead weight loss area, typically they call it the black wedge because it usually has to do here in this uh, area where neither the consumer nor the producer gets it. Because sometimes if, if, if this fluctuates, one side or the other will benefit, all right? But a lot of times when the government comes in 
and taxes, we create this dead weight loss and, and nobody really benefits from it. All right, this will bring us now to the um, one of our probably uh, more important economic concepts called elasticity. And elasticity is responsiveness. All right, we already talked about, we said, you know, well, if the price goes up, the quantity demanded goes down. Or if the price goes down, the quantity demanded goes up. All right, now we're going to take the next step. We're going to say, all right, we understand that, but, but by how much does the, you know, the price go, goes up, does the quantity demanded go down, you know, by a lot? Or, or, or a marginal amount, or, or very little, or not at all. So it's the response, the quantity response to a change in price. Now, the most important of the elasticities is elasticity of demand. If you're ever running your own business, or, or, or any business that you're involved in, it is very important to understand the elasticity of demand of your product. There are other elasticities, too, that we'll talk about, elasticity of supply, and that has to do with you and I, not as uh, consumers, but as producers. And again, it has to do with response. The price changed. Do we respond? Well, if the price goes up, as we said uh, last week, the price, price goes up, the quantity supplied typically goes up, all right? Now, we're going to ask it, but by how much? That's elasticity of supply. Does it go up by a whole heck of a lot when you raise the price a bit? Or does it go up just a, a marginal amount? Or does it not go up at all? And, and that, that can happen. Again, though, the key is the elasticity of demand, because that, that's going to tell us how we should operate our business because if you have a very inelastic demand curve, it's going to look something like this. It's going to look like a, a, a giant eye. Now, it looks that way because there's no movement back and forth. Remember, the x-axis is quantity. So moving back and forth, that's a change in quantity. Well, if the item is very inelastic, there is no movement back and or very, very, very little movement back and forth. The only movement, as you can see, would be up and down, and that's the price. So if you have an item in your, in your operation and it has a rather inelastic or totally inelastic demand curve, you'll be more prone to raise your price because you're not going, there's not going to be any or much movement in quantity. Okay, and remember, you know, the, uh, uh, the very, very, very simple rule in business, uh, total revenue is equal to what? Quantity times price, okay? So, when we look at that, we say, all right, well, if this is an inelastic demand curve, hey, I raise my, my price, you know, a fair amount. That's, gonna that's the price effect. That's going to help my total revenue. And if it's, if it's almost a, a vertical line, the, the quantity going down is going to be either very, very, very small or not existent. So in this case, you would tend to raise your price. This case is what they call unitary, meaning a one-to-one -one, uh, trade-off between the price and quantity. You know, you raise your price 10% uh, and you lose about 10% of your business, so it's unitary. Would you uh, raise your price uh, when you have a unitary um, uh, elastic, uh, unitary elastic demand? Well, the, uh, there's other marketing uh, factors that may come into play. You may decide that, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to gain a whole heck of a lot if it's a one-to-one -one trade-off, but uh, perhaps 
by you know, I ra I'm raising the price, I'm now appealing to a uh, a different clientele. All right, so there therein lies uh, the case where marketing will come in into play. Do uh, do I want to bring my product to another higher level of clientele? It's not going to strictly speaking, it's not going to generate more uh, total revenue for you because there's that trade-off. But in the long term, if you've decided that you want to move your product into a, a higher level of uh, consumers, that could pay off in the longer run. But right now, we're, 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 we're more in the, in, in the shorter term. Now, if the demand curve is horizontal or rather flat, notice there is a huge I mean, really big movement right and left, not hardly any movement up or down. All right. This is an example of totally elastic uh, demand, which we will uh, talk about a little later when we start talking about perfect competition. Um, if it's not quite as severe as that, this, but let's say it is pretty pretty darn elastic. Let's say it's like uh, that. That is a, a pretty darn elastic demand curve. Not totally elastic, but pretty elastic. What would you do here? Well, here you might say, well, okay, I'm certainly not going to raise the price because a little change in, in price is going to have a huge change in uh, the quantity I sell. But in this case, you might get the folks together in your business and say, hey, where can we cut our cost? Is there any area that we can cut our cost and, and present our product to market at a slightly lower price? Now, what that does, yes, at you know, first blush, you say, well, that's going to hurt. The, uh, you know, the price effect's going to hurt. So your price is going to but if it's just a little, you go down a little bit. Okay, but here's, here's what happens. If you can work it out, so you've come down just a little with the price. Look what happens to the quantity that you end up selling. You came down just a little in the price but there was elastic. There was a big, a big response. So you gained all this quantity being sold. So in this case, the quantity effect far outweighs the price effect. So in this scenario, you would most probably try to cut the cost a little bit, bring your product to market at a cheaper, slightly cheaper price, and gain a lot in terms of uh, quantity, all right? Again, elasticity of demand is probably one of the, the most important. Now, there is also elasticity of, of supply, all right? Now, again, though, the same principles hold. It's responsiveness. What happens? Well, in this case, You've got, uh, if, if, if it's rather inelastic, you have a supply, well, I'll go out like this. You have a supply curve that looks something like this. Now, you notice it's mostly moving up and down, not much this way. I've had friends who had uh, uh, nice, you know, smaller manufacturing companies, and they were, you know, making a nice uh, 15, 18% profit and they were they were real happy with where, where they were at running one shift had some pretty expensive equipment and if the price of the product went up uh you know they were saying no we're, we're, we're not going to start that second shift we're not going to bother and i was always amazed at what, what do you mean you're not going to you're not going to sell more well they're not going to sell more because they would say you know it's just not worth it we have a, there's a higher price granted, but in order to uh, address that with more quantity, we have to start a second shift. Got to bring in 
uh, shipping and receiving people. We have to bring in quality control people. We have to bring in foremen. We have to bring in some laborers. We have to bring in all these people. And on top of it, they're running some really sophisticated, uh, expensive equipment. And I have to, you know, say I have to worry every night that what happens if they wreck, you know, these, uh, let's say, a machining center at $800,000, you certainly don't want it wrecked on your afternoon shift. Or even if they don't wreck it, let's say they run the, the, the tool tooling on it uh, all night long and it's all, it's all dull when the day shift gets there in the morning. So the day shift has end up, you know, spending an hour and a half resharpening the tools, setting uh, blocks and so on and so forth. They say it's just not worth it. So that kind of scenario, you're going to get a rather inelastic supply curve. Now, again, you can go with um, a one-to-one -one, uh, response, which was a supply curve like this. And that's about, you know, again, you have, uh, you know, the price goes up 10%. Well, the quantity supply goes up 10%. Lastly, we get a very, very, very elastic supply curve. Now, that would be something that you're in a business, perhaps uh, we're looking at lemonade stands in this other course I'm teaching. Well, if you've got a lemonade stand and the price goes up and it's not a big deal for you, to you know, increase your production, you're not investing in uh, seven hundred fifty thousand dollar pieces of equipment. You know, you're uh, you're selling lemonade, and if it goes up from from a dollar to a dollar and a quarter, yeah, if it's not hard for you to increase your production, you're going to you're going to increase it in a big way. There'll be a big response. All right, so that's that'll give us a supply curve that is more elastic. Again more upright for both demand and supply. And this is something we're gonna to need to remember when we start talking about taxes. More upright, more inelastic, more horizontal moving left and to the left and to the right, more elastic, big change, okay? And again, this is a, um, a very important concept in elasticity. Finally, and I'll mention that there's uh, elast income elasticity. Now, income el elasticity has to do with if your income goes up, what happens? Well, that has to do with what kind of goods are we talking about? Typically, normally, if your income, let's say you graduate from a comb, you're doing better, uh, you got a big promotion. Well, as your income goes up, Typically, you will buy more stuff. All right, those are that's called um, or those are called normal goods. You typically will buy more as your income goes up. Now, there are some goods that if you're you got a really big promotion, your uh, your uh, purchasing of them goes way up. Those would be like luxury goods, whether it could be expensive clothing. Uh, jewelry, uh, vacation home, uh, something of that nature. On a luxury good, your income goes up dramatically. You're going to start jumping at these luxury goods, and, and that's going to be more of a, a big response on your part. But remember, economics, the reverse is also true. If for some reason, God forbid, you get a big cut in your pay, what's the first thing that's going to be cut? Well, it's going to be, you know, the luxury goods. Then finally, they have goods that are uh, such that as your income goes up, you, you, you tend to, to buy less of them. I have uh, two sets of twins. They were in college together, uh, and they all banked at separate banks. But every Friday, they would call me, and I would... I wish they all banked at the same bank. And anyway, I would go and make uh, deposits for them. Well, during the week, they were really big on ramen noodles, all right? But come Friday, when their income went up, you know, their, their consumption of ramen noodles went way down and they uh, opted for other items, okay? 
Ramen noodles would be an example of uh, an inferior good. Or it could be a no brand name pasta. You know, you're starting your career out, you're, you know, you, you got a good job, uh, but you know, still money is a little tight. You might be spending more of your food dollar on, you know, inexpensive types of pasta. As your career progresses and you're doing well, you know, you get a couple of uh, raises. Well, now your income's going up. What happens? Well, you're, you're probably going to buy less of the no brand or no, none of the no brand name pasta. You may end up buying higher high end pasta or, you know, ditching pasta altogether and going with fish or meat or whatever. So if you buy less of a product, when your income goes up, they call that an inferior good. Okay. All right. So that's, I'm going to cut this uh, short because I'm going to try to keep these uh, videos short. It's a little easier to, um, uh, you know, copy them and post them. But uh, this, there'll be another video uh, coming out uh, in just a couple minutes for this week. So I'm going to stop this one now and then we'll, We'll start the next one in just a minute.